All right. So um, by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the lesser offering we have at Amazon, specifically Amazon FSX for Lester? That's good to see. So hopefully those who didn't raise your hands, this will change um, later today. So uh, my name is Daryl Osborne. I'm a principal solutions architect with uh, the file storage team at AWS. And uh, I am able to deliver to you uh, a Lustre file system faster than our two-day prime shipping. Any reaction, no reaction? Oh, okay. All right, so um, I was, when I was putting this together, I was um, planning on doing a live demo. Um, and for those who have stood up a Lustre file system before on-prem, you know, acquired hardware, racked and stacked the hardware, um, you know, connected it, installed the software, um, you know, formatted disks, you, you name it. How long would that take? How long did that take you? Could you do it in a day? Uh, a week? Maybe, maybe in a week. Well, uh, today in my demo, I'm going to be standing up, starting from nothing, standing up a, a Lustre file system with 100 terabytes of data, uh, connecting it to a, and standing up at the same time, a 40 node compute cluster with 1200 com, um, uh, compute cores and being able to drive that file system over 200 gigabytes per second, all starting from scratch. And at the same time doing this live demo, I'll be giving the presentation and I thought that wasn't enough, so I thought I'm gonna juggle at the same time. <laughs> that was a little too ambitious, so I decided I'm going to drop the juggling and just do the live demo and the presentation. So with that said, let's get into the demo. So um, I'm gonna start out, everyone can see my um, FSX console. Let me see if I can make this a little easier for you to see. Um, you can see that we don't have any file systems. This is running in my, uh, in my account in the US West 2 region. We also don't have any EC2 instances. Hopefully you can see that, um, and I'll do a refresh. So no EC2 instances. Uh, but I am going to be, I do have my Parallel Cluster Manager started. So what I'm gonna do is actually use Parallel Cluster to launch my 40 node cluster and create my Lustre file system all at the same time. So I'm gonna call this my LUG 2023 demo. I'm gonna use a, uh, a file, a, a, clust, uh, a parallel cluster configuration file. Let's make this a little easier. Um, and I already have that file created. And what this is, is basically showing us um, where I'm gonna be creating this environment in, what, uh, what subnet, um, the configuration of my, my head node and my compute nodes, there's gonna be 40 compute nodes. These are the EC2 instance types that I'm, I'm gonna be using. Uh, the subnet, where all these resources are gonna be launched. Uh, and then the configuration of my FSX for Lustre file system. It'll be a 100.8 uh, uh, tebabyte file system. And it's going to have a per unit of throughput of 1,000 megabytes per second per tebabyte of storage. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick dry run, make sure everything looks good. Everything looks good, and we're going to go ahead and create it. So behind the scenes, what's happening is we're actually using cloud formation. Cloud formation is basically it's infrastructure as a code service. It's an orchestration service that we have where you can actually build your environment using code and you can create, basically use that template, that file to create your environment. You could stand up uh, you know, all of your networking components, um, Lustre file systems, compute nodes, um, you name it, you can use CloudFormation to go ahead and, and stand up your environment. We have a lot of customers that use this with that. So, as it's launching all of my resources, I'll go back to our FSX console. And here within the next few seconds, we already see it, the file system is now creating. So we can see that it's creating a, uh, we can go into it. 
Uh, it's creating a, a thousand or a hundred point uh, eight tebabyte file system at a thousand megabytes per second. So I'll be able to drive this a hundred gigabytes per second. That's the disk throughput, a hundred gigabytes per second. But we're going to drive it a little more than that. Um, but what I want to do is I actually want to link this to S3. We have very tight S3 integration with FSx for Lester. So what I'm going to do is actually create what we call a data repository association. Uh, so I'll go ahead and do that now. I'm going to um, create this link on my file system side to this path. I'm actually using some NASA NEX data that's in our open data set um, registry. And I'm going to link it to this S3 bucket. It's one of my buckets. It has this NASA NEX data in it. It's my US West 2 NASA NEX bucket. I'm going to import the metadata from the repository. So when the file system is created and my data repository is created, all the metadata, so all of the objects, the prefixes is in that um, S3 path will be created as file system objects within my Lustre file system. I'm also going to set uh, and create two policies, an import policy and an export policy. An import policy will basically say that any changes to my data repository or my S3 bucket, my prefix, um, any new changed or deleted um, operations will be propagated to my file system as metadata changes. And then the export policy says that any file system operations, such as newly created files directories, um, any, anything that changes, any deletes, will be propagated back down to my S3 um, data repository. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. And we'll see that it's going to be in a creating phase. Um, and then as soon as the file system is created, the data repository association will be created, and then the metadata will be imported into my Lustre file system. So that's basically it. That's all I'm going to be doing for right now. And we can get back to the presentation. So this is the environment that I'm creating. Um, and this is what I started out with. So I have my AWS account um, in a region, the US West 2 region. I have some data sitting in S3. I'm actually going to be using this data um, as, as a part of the demo. Uh, and I add my parallel cluster manager created as well. Uh, but what my parallel cluster manager configuration file is going to be doing is creating an FSx for Lustre file system. It'll be creating, I created that DRA association to my S3 bucket. Um, the parallel cluster manager is also going to be creating a head node and 40 compute nodes. Once that's done, I'm going to go in and do the demo, actually drive uh, over 200 gigabytes per second of throughput to this file system. All within 30 minutes. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the use cases that we have. Um, talk about the architecture of FSx for Lustre. Uh, talk about the HSM solution that we have with Amazon S3. Um, talk a little bit about for performance and how we're able to achieve the performance that we can get. And then hopefully, I'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. So Rivian really wants to. Uh, um, they're on a mission to really keep the world uh, adventurous forever. So um, they are really dedicated to making sustainable um, electric vehicles and, and basically making this available to us. Um, so um, as you know, with all the, um, the EV uh, solutions out there um, and the engineering that is involved, uh, they need to do a lot of training and simulations. Uh, so they use um, AWS and FSx for Lustre to accelerate the workload, all these training simulations that they're doing. We also have Roche. So Roche um, actually has their next generation personalized healthcare system, Apollo, running on AWS. And, and with that, they also use FSx for Lustre um, in their analytical model to decrease the amount of time it takes to run these, um, these processes for them. So they went from two to three days of, of processing down to actually getting to the results in just minutes using AWS. And then Maxar, um, they do um, numerical weather forecasting models on AWS, and uh, they're actually able to uh, get to the forecast 58% faster 
on AWS than what they were doing with the NOAA uh, supercomputer that they were using previously. So just a few examples of customers leveraging FSx for Lester um, with AWS. So when we take a look at the architecture, um, all of us are probably familiar with the, what this looks like. On the left-hand side, we have the, the Lustre client. We have our object storage clients and the metadata clients, all connected to the Lustre file system over the network. Lustre file system made up of the management server, the metadata server, and the related targets, as well as one or more object storage servers and object storage targets. So, Within uh, FSx for Lustre, we actually have two different storage types that we provide. We want to give customers the, uh, the flexibility to select the storage type best suited for their workload and their price point. Uh, so we have an HDD-based storage and SSD-based storage. We also have deployment types. So the HDD deployment type is only persistent and the SSD is scratch and persistent. So what's the difference between those? So we go back to our Lustre diagram. For persistent file systems, we monitor and will replace um, the resource that is running the management server and the metadata server. Uh, so in the event that that resource were to fail, we automatically detect and will replace that resource. No IP um, address change, no DNS change. Uh, we will replace it, we will reattach the targets associated with that, and then the file system will continue to, to operate uh, just fine. Likewise, in the event that one of the targets were to fail, the, the management target or the metadata target, um, that too would be, is, uh, is replicated within the availability zone. So a failure of one of the targets is um, basically transparent, is seamless. We in the background will go ahead and, and um, uh, recover all of that, um, and we will make sure that there is a, another replica of that data in that availability zone. So it is transparent to the application, um, and we manage all that as a part of the service. Um, when we look at the object storage server, uh, again, we monitor and um, will replace the object storage server in the event that it would fail. And the same with the object storage targets. We will, uh, because that data is replicated, it's automatically um, available and, and recovered. So our scratch file systems are a little different. If you notice, we went from the, um, the OSTs with the persistent we're having basically replicated OSTs to non-replicated OSTs with Scratch. So with Scratch, they are designed for temporary workloads. So, um, but in the, in, in, in the case that um, a metadata server were to fail, uh, we also detect and will replace it, just like the persistent. Same with the metadata target. But with object storage servers and targets, we do not replace them because these are designed for short-term temporary workloads. Um, we will not replace the object storage servers in the event that they fail, nor would we replace the object storage targets if they were to fail. Okay, so um, of those different storage and deployment types, we have um, different disk throughput levels. So um, on the persistent HDD, we have uh, 12 um, megabytes per second per tebabyte and 40 megabytes per second per tebabyte. On the Scratch, we only have 200 megabytes per second per tebabyte. Then on the SSD persistent, we have either 125, 250, 500, or 1,000 megabytes per second per tebabyte, all depending on what your performance needs are and what you want to do. So on our HDD persistent, we also have the option to deploy an SSD read cache. So this read cache um, will allow you to, for frequently accessed data, that data can reside in that read cache to improve the performance of the HDD um, file system. All of these all have different price points, any, ranging anywhere from 2.5 cents per gigabyte month all the way up to 60 cents per gigabyte month. So depending on um, where you want to be in terms of price and where you want to be in terms of performance, um, we should have an offering uh, for you. Okay, so with that said, let's um, take a look at um, some of the, the minimum sizes and really the number of uh, MDTs and the, um, the uh, OSSs that we deploy um, 
as a part of the service. So the minimum size for these file systems differ depending on the deployment type and the storage type, anywhere from 1.2 um, terabytes all the way up to 6 terabytes. We also have incrementals, how we grow the file system. And those two uh, have different sizes, anywhere from 1.8 terabytes up to 6 terabytes. Um, the OSS count um, is uh, basically one per this size of, of file system. So anywhere from 1.8 terabytes up to 6 terabytes. So what we do is as you incrementally grow your file system, and you can also grow and add additional storage to a live file system, we do it by adding an additional OSS and we will attach um, OSTs to that as well. So then the OST size is 1.5 terabytes for our 12 megabytes per second HDD persistent file system, 1.8 for the 40 megabytes per second, and then the 1.2 for either the scratch or persistent SSD. And the OST count per OSS, either four, one, or two. And then we always deploy one MDS and attached to, attached to that is one replicated uh, MDT. So as an example, with my uh, 100.8 terabyte file system, I'll have one MDS with one replicated MDT. Uh, I will have 42 OSSs. All of this is automatically being deployed. Um, and I will have 48 OSTs attached. Um, one ENI will be associated with each server that's created. So one ENI is a, uh, uh, um, an ENI is, a, is an elastic network interface, basically an IP address that's going to be consumed within your subnet. Um, so you'll have one for the MDS, and you'll have one for each OSS that is deployed. In my case, I'm going to have 42 IPs or 42 ENIs that are going to be allocated within my, within my subnet for my, uh, all of my OSSs. All right, so if we dive deeper into my demo environment, we'll actually take a look at this a little bit more. Um, behind the scenes, these resources are actually launched within um, the FSX service account, um, and they are attached to the, in the same availability zone, the AZ, that the, cluster, that the customer created the file system in. Um, and we create an ENI in that VPC. Uh, so that's how the client connections actually flow to the resources that are actually running in the, uh, in the FSX account. Um, this is a fully managed service. So um, customers do not have access to logging into the, the MDS, the OSS, um, anything like that. You basically, just like I did, with code or through the console, you can stand up a file system. We will then manage it behind the scenes as a part of the FSX service. Uh, you get an endpoint and you can just start interacting uh, with it uh, when you need to. Okay. So when we look at the, um, the HSM solution we have too with, uh, with S3, um, we actually have DRAs. So you can have up to eight DRAs associated with a file system. A DRA is basically a linkage between a, a file system path and a, an S3 path. Um, you can't have any overlapping um, paths on either side, um, and you can associate a different import and export policy for each one. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this, uh, what this looks like. So, um, and let's look at our demo environment. So everything is still creating. Um, I'll do a quick, looks like the file system has been created. And the data repository looks like that is in the process of, of creating too. So within the next few minutes, that'll be a, a available. So what I am going to do is I'm going to pop over to my other demo environment. And I'll show you what we have. So in this environment, I've got a very small, this is another file system I have created, a very small file system. Um, it's mounted as a slash FSX. It is linked to my S3 bucket. My S3 bucket is um, sitting over here. And these are the, uh, the resources um, underneath my uh, NEX DCP30 directory. So what we'll show here is... Um,
All right, so if I go into that, we can see that all of those resources there correspond to the resources we have within my S3 bucket. But only the metadata is loaded, because if we look at, if we do the, uh, the disk free command again, we see that there's no data loaded. So what we want to do is, um, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to go ahead and grab this path. And this is one of the files I'm going to be working with. And down here, I'm just going to be running nload. So we can see in real time what activity is happening on this, on this file system. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just do a simple ls against this file. So we see that we have all the metadata there. It's a 1.1 gigabyte file. We have the permissions. We have all that information. But what we want to do is we can also take a look at the git stripe of that file. We see that it does have a stripe count of two, uh, but it's released. So the data portion hasn't been loaded into the file system yet. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and read this. So I'm just going to cat this into, into my file system. Now look down below at the throughput of my EC2 instance. Notice we don't see any activity yet, even though I already um, launched the, uh, the cat command. So it took 9.7 seconds to do that. But we didn't see any activity until that final you know, one second. That's because FSX noticed that, hey, the data isn't loaded. It goes, gets that object from S3, loads it in the file system, then delivers it to this client. If I do this again, it's going to be very fast. Now, you know that I'm cheating because we don't see any network throughput on this EC2 instance. Why? It's cached on my Lustre client. So let's go ahead and drop the cache. and run it again. And now you notice that within less than one second, we were able to load the file. Now that the file has been loaded to FSX for Lustre, now all of the repeatable reads from any of the, the, the clients that actually have that file system mounted will be able to access it with that, uh, with that level of speed. All right. so. Let's go ahead and take a look at our HSM restore command. So let's make sure that our DRA is created. It is, and this is pending. So here in the next minute or two, or even less, probably within the next 30 seconds, this will be, this will be available. What we'll do is actually create, we'll, we'll uh, issue a, uh, an HSM restore command for a data set that I have loaded in my file system. So um, let me go ahead and just take a look at all of my um, compute nodes that were launched as a part of this. I'm going to go to my head node, and I'm going to connect to it. So I have another SSH session. I'm going to go ahead and connect to this EC2 instance. say yes and we'll see that how this is mounted this is mounted as slash fsx if we do an lfsdf slash h against it you're going to notice that very large file system so again we have one um, mdt and we have 84 osts attached to this file system uh, i'm going to go ahead and just do a quick install And then by this time, it should be, the import should be completed. So let's go ahead and I'm going to just run tree and I'm going to look at the files. I have some um, net uh, CDF files that I want to look at. So there's 9.6 tebabytes of data that I want to load, okay? So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to issue this HSM restore command. And we're going to load this data into the file system. All right, so in six seconds, I issue the HSM restore. In the background, it's going to be loading all this data. So what we'll do, we'll go back to my file system, the monitoring tab. And in the monitoring tab, I'm going to open up the throughput. 
I'm going to view this in the metrics. I'll expand this down. And the auto refresh is set. So within the next minute or so, we're going to see that we're going to be able to drive this file system, and this data is going to be um, imported into the in the file system. Three While minutes. That yep. Is loading and showing the graph. Uh, might we be able to take some maybe initial questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So any questions? while that is running. Yes. That's a stretch. Do we, does AWS provide some capabilities for an existing Lustre file system to be able to tie into some of these AWS features? So um, where would that file system be hosted? Um, at our home at data our center where we do have ESNet tie-ins. Yeah, so there's no sort of integration with say on-prem Lustre file systems. Um, you would, there's a couple of ways that you can get the data into an FSx for Lester file system. We have data sync and other processes to migrate that data over, but there's no um, tie-in to on-prem um, file systems. Any other questions? So let me just go, I know we're, We've got two minutes left. Let me uh, let me do another LFSDF against this um, file system. We'll see. All right, so we've already loaded the 9.6 tablets of data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and use my cluster manager. Uh, I'm going to basically launch a my um, Slurm batch on this instance create my file, basically I'm gonna tell all 40 nodes to read all 9.6 tabloids of data. I'm gonna go ahead and kick that off. And just make sure that all of our jobs are running, all of the jobs are running. So again, what we're gonna be able to do is back here, we'll be able to see this jump up after we load the initial data, which should reach close to 100 gigabytes per, uh, per second. Um, all of the read operations from all 40 nodes will be able to drive that up to over 200 gigabytes per second of throughput. So while that's going on, so right now we're already hitting um, 100, over 100 megabytes per second during the data load, then the read operations should come immediately after that. So any more, any more questions? We'll just, if we can wait two more minutes, we'll just let this, we'll let this, um, this read operation continue and we'll be able to see all 200 gigabytes per second of throughput. So one of, the, one of the ways that we're able to achieve this level of performance is that when you take a look at the different com the components, we have network, um, cache storage, and disk storage. So all of them have a different performance characteristic. So and all of these are based on the, the, uh, the per tebabyte size of the file system. We also leverage compression as well. Now my file system isn't taking advantage of compression, but with compression enabled, we use LZ4 compression, um, we could actually double the disk throughput of that file system. So um, in, in short, these are all of the features that are available, not all of the features, these are some of the features available, whether FSx for Lustre file systems. We have a HDD storage and, and SSD storage, uh, either persistent or scratch um, deployment types. We have LZ4 compression available, um, so we also have um, layouts, so um, striping layouts. So you can, you know, from the Lustre client, configure layouts against your file system, either at the file system level, directory level, or file level. Uh, you can also do PFLs, so you can set the, the, the uh, stripe configuration um, at, at any of those levels. Online storage capacity increases. We can increase that um, while the fi file system is online. We support root squash, storage quotas, encryption of data at rest and in transit, uh, HSM solutions with S3, automatic backups, that these are just-in-time consistent 
backups to the file system, as well as weekly maintenance. Um, so let's see how we're doing in terms of performance. So again, give this another minute or two. I'm not sure we have another minute. Okay, so what I can do <laughs> is I'll show you, basically this is what, um, I ran this just earlier. Um, the total throughput of the file system is 100 uh, gigabytes per second. We were able to achieve just above that at 106 gigabytes per second. Um, for that initial load operation, but gen then during the read operation, we're able to drive 200 gigabytes per second and even up to 232 gigabytes per second. How? Because the data is cached in the cache storage. It doesn't have to go to disk. Our file system's performance is rated at 1,000 megabytes per second per tebabyte at the disk level. So with that data in the cache storage and with a higher network performance, of in this file system, this file system is able to achieve 262 gigabytes per second of network performance. I'm able to drive much higher uh, performance than, um, than the disk performance of, uh, of my file system. So we do have one more session coming up tomorrow. I think Matt Vaughn, who is here, he's gonna be giving a session tomorrow, so turn in, uh, tune into that. And uh, there, we did do it. So we were able to achieve <laughs> 212 gigabytes per second, did all of this within, roughly within, uh, within 30 minutes. Within 30 minutes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.